At this time, I have the honor to present to you the moral leader of our nation. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. You'll notice the exact date, the exact issues to protest were changed several times. But in spring 1962, civil rights leaders announced they would have a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. You'll also notice they were immediately met with resistance. Even though Dr. King wrote to a colleague that the march could be one of the greatest demonstrations for freedom that has ever been held in America, the establishment in Washington believed the protests could be counterproductive, leading to civil unrest. According to Mark Stern in his book Calculating Visions, Rumors flew about Washington that massive sit-ins in the Congress or traffic blockages in the streets would be used to disrupt the nation's capital. Fear was in the air. How can this country endure, asked Senator Russell of Georgia, when we legislate on the basis of threat and intimidation from mobs? But it wasn't only Southern senators with concerns. Even presidents of the AFL-CIO and NAACP feared that clashes in D.C. could hurt the effort to pass sweeping civil rights legislation through the Congress. Two days later, President Kennedy hosted the organizers of the march in the White House. His purpose was clear lower both the expectations and the initiative of the activists, lower their expectations that civil rights legislation could be passed without compromise, lower their initiative to have a large event in Washington, D.C. He told them, we want success in the Congress, not a big show on the Capitol. In other words, stay home, don't demonstrate. Even admitting that sit-ins and freedom rights had done wonders to change public opinion, Kennedy requested the leaders abandon their plans. You might be wondering why Kennedy would resist a march, a tactic he knew to be effective. JFK was an icon of the civil rights movement, and yet there he was, actively resisting organizers. This isn't an isolated example. As you'll see, Kennedy wasn't a natural leader on civil rights. And to truly grasp his imperfections with this topic, we need to go deeper. The March on Washington was planned 100 years after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Between these two events, the Proclamation and the March, black Americans participated in every American military conflict. Over one million enlisted in World War II alone. And yet when they returned home, they continued to face a system designed to keep them segregated in public and distanced from the ballot box. In 1940, only 3% of African Americans in the South were registered to vote. 1954's Brown vs. Board of Education, declaring segregated schools for black and white children unconstitutional was widely resisted. And the 1957 Civil Rights Act passed under the Eisenhower administration lacked the teeth necessary to substantively improve these conditions. In fact, Eisenhower had to use the National Guard to force the integration of nine African American students into Little Rock Central High School. These were the rumbles under society, threatening a larger quake. With the 57 Civil Rights Act, the federal government had shown its willingness to intervene, but a more active chief executive would be necessary to achieve full constitutional rights for African Americans. Inner our mixed figure, John F. Kennedy. As the senator from Massachusetts, he supported the watered-down reforms of the 1950s. But rather than pushing for something more substantive, he always had his eye on the politics specifically the presidency. As Robert Dalek writes in his biography of Kennedy, An Unfinished Life, Jack's interest in civil rights was more political than moral. The only blacks he knew were chauffeurs, valets, or domestics with whom he had minimal contact. He could not empathize and only faintly sympathize with the pains felt by African Americans. But you can push this even further. Kennedy knew the Democratic Party victory. His victory in a national election involved winning black voters while also not alienating the vast Democratic South. Again, reading from Mark Stern's Calculating Visions. The black rights issue was not of particular interest to him. Kennedy, the senator, was never to stray too far into the civil rights thicket. He was keenly aware of the Democratic Party divisions over civil rights. White Southerners wanted the federal government to stay away from this issue. In their view, it was strictly a state matter. Blacks and their allies wanted federal intervention in civil rights. It was the only way to bring about change. These calculations didn't end once Kennedy entered the 1960 presidential election against then Vice President Richard Nixon. This is the second in a series of programs unmatched in history. Never have so many people seen the major candidates for President of the United States at the same time. And here tonight are the Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy.
In the second presidential debate, Kennedy attacked Nixon for failing to address central questions on civil rights. Senator Kennedy. Well, Mr. Nixon hasn't discussed the two basic questions. What is going to be done and what will be his policy on implementing the Supreme Court decision of 1954? Secondly, what's he going to do to provide fair employment? But then, when asked to submit a solution of his own, he gave a sorry four-point plan. One which had already happened a few years before, and three points which were vague and non-committal. If you're like me, you'll find his words empty and politician-y. We sit on a conspicuous stage. We are a goldfish bowl before the world. We have to practice what we preach. We set a very high standard for ourselves. The communists do not. They set a low standard of materialism. We preach in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution, in the statement of our greatest leaders, we preached very high standards. This was the political reality, both presidential candidates vaguely supportive of civil rights, but neither with concrete plans. Kennedy and the Democratic Party platform were so imprecise, in fact, that a New York Times editorial declared Nixon's plan somewhat more realistic. All that said, Kennedy's calculation that he could be the lesser of two evils paid off. Senator Kennedy, his wife and mother go into the armory for his victory speech. Here inside the armory, the once very junior senator from Massachusetts, now at the age of 43, the president-elect of the United States. He won the 1960 election, achieving over 70% of the African-American vote. The popular vote column, by the way, it's still very close. Uh, Senator Kennedy's lead is about, uh, well, roughly 700,000. The election's so narrow, he could not have won without them. And so the logical question was, now in power, would he continue to operate as a hollow supporter of civil rights? Or would he rise to the occasion and let actions overcome his missing words? Historian Thomas Reeves wrote of Kennedy's values entering office. He brought, quote, many of the ideas his father had instilled in all the Kennedy children, among them his overall lack of interest in domestic reform. And tensions between the incoming president and civil rights leaders were high. Martin Luther King told Harris Wolford that while I'm convinced he has the understanding and the political skill, I'm afraid that the moral passion is missing. To him, Kennedy seemed dedicated only to token integration. Again, reading from Dalek's An Unfinished Life. Much of the resentment during the first six months of Kennedy's term concerned the fact that he would neither sign a promised executive order desegregating federally financed housing, nor ask Congress for a civil rights law. Aside from occasional actions of the Justice Department under Bobby Kennedy on voting rights or the hiring of quote 50 outstanding Negroes to high administrative posts, JFK's first months in office were mute on civil rights. In his book The Evolving Presidency, Michael Nelson writes that not only did he fail to press for new laws to protect the rights of African Americans and other racial minorities, but he also resisted taking the executive actions he had promised during the campaign, such as ending discrimination in federally funded public housing. To civil rights leaders, it seemed that the president would never change strategy. Kennedy was settling for political stability over fundamental change. But as you'll see, events in the coming years would rattle his stance. Starting in 1961, black and white activists rode interstate buses through the Deep South to protest segregation in public transportation. After all, the Supreme Court decision in Virginia v. Boynton had made racial seating in interstate travel illegal. For their efforts, the activists were stopped, beaten, firebombed if lucky, merely arrested. Kennedy, while, yes, pursuing backroom deals to end the violence, in my opinion, came to an odd conclusion. The provocations of protesters were antagonizing whites. Rather than being supportive, he believed that the rides needed to end. Can't you get your goddamn friends off those buses? He was more embarrassed than concerned, citing an upcoming meeting with Soviet Secretary Khrushchev as a reason to stop the rides. How foolish would he appear to the Russians with racial tensions boiling back home? Through this, Kennedy became what Dr. King later described as the Negro's great stumbling block. Not the Ku Klux Klanner, but rather the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Who prefers a negative peace which is the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice. Who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action.
This letter was part of an effort to combat Kennedy's apathy. King endeavored to awaken the nation's conscience. The words were written by King sitting in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama, where he was arrested for demonstrating against that city's racial segregation, potentially the worst in the entire nation. In May 1963, the all-white local politicians involved the all-white police force and fire department to prevent, quote, parading, demonstrating, boycotting, or picketing of any kind. You are in violation of section 1159 Dallas City Code, demonstrating and parading without a permit. Also violating a traffic judge injunction against parade. Those in violation were met with nightclubs, canines, and water hoses. If the president wouldn't act, Dr. King hoped the images on TV of peaceful demonstrations suppressed with such violence would awaken a movement forcing action from the White House. At the climax of the campaign in Birmingham, the activists made the controversial decision to involve children in the marches. Stephen Levingston, in his book, describes how this tactic played out with authorities. Water burst from the fire hoses, bombarding the children, knocking them to the ground and spinning them down the street. To enhance the force, firefighters funneled the flow of two hoses into one nozzle, packing it with such ballistic fury it dislodged bricks from buildings. These jets were directed at the children, driving across their bodies, lacerating their flesh, tearing clothing off their backs. Levingston goes on to write, Before Birmingham, only 4% of Americans polled believed civil rights was the country's most urgent issue. After Birmingham, that figure jumped to 52%. This is what happened as Nicholas Katzenbach, accompanied by two federal marshals, left their car and approached Governor Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door. The two Negro students, Vivian Malone and Jimmy A. Hood, stayed in the car. The time was about 12.47 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. A month later, in June 1963, the University of Alabama was ordered by a federal district judge to integrate Vivian Malone and James Hood into their student body. Alabama Governor George Wallace literally stood in the door of the Foster Auditorium on campus in order to block their registration, only standing down when ordered by the National Guard. Then, and only then, indeed that very night after Governor Wallace stood down, Kennedy snapped into action. So quickly, it seems like the story gets ahead of itself. On television, and with moral clarity, Kennedy was ready to give full thread support to comprehensive civil rights legislation. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression, and this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. So wait a minute, because our story seemingly advanced at random. We established President Kennedy as a man of inaction. He rejected countless previous opportunities to intervene on behalf of civil rights, and now, suddenly, there he was, a changed man. A cynic looks at Kennedy at this moment and critiques the president. Making a plea on television didn't advance a civil rights bill through the Congress. Vice President Lyndon Johnson, someone who made their career negotiating bills in the Senate, doubted that it could be done. And forces were immediately set against the bill, as 17 Southern senators met for over an hour the next morning to strategize how to kill it at all costs. On the other hand, no president before had ever spoken on the issue with absolution and conviction. Clearly, Kennedy made the realization that his balancing act style strategy was failing. Furthermore, it seems he felt a compulsion to act as a moral leader in that moment. Levingston writes that he not only asserted his political will, he also lifted the nation onto a higher moral plane. Though five months prior he had told confidants that civil rights legislation was off the table, he clearly changed his mind. Both he and Vice President Johnson recognized that their actions might mean losing the South to Republicans for generations to come. But they did it anyway. And the next day, civil rights leaders like Dr. King flooded the White House with praise. Now, let me give you my opinion, because after watching this far, you might find yourself believing that President Kennedy is the protagonist of our story. Like great heroes in all classic tales, a champion is born, faces a challenge, rejects his call to action, but eventually, makes the choice to fight for what's right and to grow as a person. But unfortunately, history is not a fairy tale and John F. Kennedy is not a hero. 
Kennedy, the American people, the leadership in Congress, the future president who actually would usher through the passage of civil rights legislation in 1964, they all were dragged by their collars in the direction of justice. At every turn, it was civil rights leaders like Dr. King who impressed the dire urgency of action onto the president. It was they who surveyed the candidates in 1960, demanding their agendas be improved, who made constant contact with the newly elected commander-in-chief, asking why his housing reforms weren't in place, why he wasn't protecting the Freedom Riders, why he only supported token integration of public schools, who wrote to him and the white establishment from a jail cell. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings clear in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. Kennedy may have eventually come to the decision to introduce civil rights legislation, and maybe he did grow as a leader in doing so, but the political capital necessary was earned through the demonstrations in Birmingham. The citizens who confronted German shepherds and water hoses to grind urgency and public support from 4% to 52% we see the true face of the unrushed Kennedy, when just 10 days after making his lauded speech to the nation, he relapsed. Sanguine from his saline sack of the status quo, he once again told civil rights leaders gathered in the White House that they should wait and not march on Washington, D.C. We want success in the Congress, not a big show on the Capitol. Now we are in a new phase, the legislative phase. To get votes, we need, we have, to oppose demonstrations which will lead to violence, and second, give Congress a fair chance to work its will. Kennedy hadn't changed. Luckily, neither had they. Frankly, King told them, I have never engaged in any direct action movement which did not seem ill-timed. A. Philip Randolph, speaking for the entire group, added, There will be a march. freedom-loving blood that is in us, and send our answer to the tyranny that clanks its chains upon the South, in the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> The top comment is a pinned explanation of why I'm now using my real name, Will Fox, and the channel name has been changed to The Exploration. This uh, video set a record in terms of books. Um, if that's the kind of level, uh, if that's the level of depth you appreciate, consider uh, supporting on Patreon on a buy video basis. Later, guys.